First item, commissioners' reports and comments. Vice President Baker, would you begin? Uh, yeah, just uh, like to say good morning. Uh, I'm sure everybody enjoyed the beautiful day yesterday. I know, uh, I know, I did, and I really appreciated the warm weather and the sun. So, uh, just a, a thought on uh, the Hancock School. I know uh, there's been a lot said, and uh, I think a lot of people are really uh, pulling for Hancock to remain open. And I think that the support's just overwhelming. And uh, my thoughts are, I just hope, uh, and this is just a thought, I hope our local Board of Education elected officials uh, are proactive and uh, make a decision soon and get that off the plate before the, and I think they could do that before the report is even uh, mm -hmm. provided to them. Uh, there's a lot of stress and uh, anxiety going on in the Hancock community, and I'm sure there's a lot going on in the Clear Spring community. And, and Cascade as well. That's and Cascade, uh, you know, those families and those parents, uh, they need to, uh, you know, just get a lot of stress out of their life, and I'm hopeful that uh, our local school board members will make the right decision and keep both of those schools open. So that, I just wanted to get that in this morning. And also, uh, maybe, John, you could help me with this. I just got a call. Uh, actually, I've had a couple of calls on the, uh, I think it's called Mills Road. I think it's Mills Road right over there toward the Boonesboro area. Mm -hmm. That runs from uh, 40, alternate 40, all the way over to Route 68. Uh, I guess they would like uh, the county to look at that road, and they said it's been uh, tar and chipped several times. They've had to go back and redo the tar and chip, and they're, yeah. and they're just... They just said the road needs looked at and, okay. and repaired uh, correctly. That's okay. What they told I mean, well, me I'll get with staff and we'll send someone. Okay. Thank you. And uh, expect to change my announcements. Thank you. Thank you, Vice President Baker. Commissioner Kiefer? Yes, sir. I have uh, two things here. Both, I think, are rather important. Uh, one, we haven't had a discussion recently on the, the baseball stadium in downtown Hagerstown. I know we've been rather neutral, and I, I think that was the right approach to take as we saw how Senate Bill 926 came through. But recently, I think we learned that our lobbyist in Annapolis, Mr. Bariano, erroneously offered the county government's unconditional support to the legislative leadership um, for the baseball stadium. And in particular, that county government would go it alone after construction and that we would be responsible for creating a self-funding mechanism. And I can only interpret that to mean taxpayers will fund that baseball stadium if it's not profitable when repairs are needed. I just wanted to take my position that I'm not opposed to a baseball stadium, but I am opposed to the taxpayers being on the hook for paying for the stadium if it's not successful. Taxpayers owning the stadium, I don't want to see that, my opinion. Uh, can I ask a question? Yeah, sure, Vice President Baker. So where did, uh, you know where Mr. Barriano got the information to, uh, to supply the uh, Senate president, or yeah, the Senate president, uh, as to how we, you know, he said that we supported the stadium and so forth. How did he get that information? I, I don't know how he got the information. To my knowledge, we have not had a meeting to to discuss yeah. that or to. I to I responded to his email and told and forwarded it to all the commissioners and clearly stated we had not yet taken a position. I think the last Herald Mail newspaper article clearly said that we were neither for or against no position we just wanted to wait to see how the finances would be arranged and I think right now that's clearly where we all stand with the additional remarks that Commissioner Kiefer just stated okay, okay. Uh, I mean anything else sir the second thing I'd like to comment on um, as Commissioner Baker had mentioned there's a lot of angst in the Hancock Clear Spring Cascade community about closing the schools and I think it would um, be good for the Board of Ed to make their intentions be known sooner rather than later. Um, 
if it's not going to happen, this is worry that's not needed in those communities. And I'd like to read an editorial from the Hancock News that was recently published. And while this certainly revolves around the Hancock schools, I think you can extrapolate many things to the Cascade community as well. The editorial was published on March 10th. It says, the timing of Washington County Public Schools review of school enrollment and facilities is so poor that they should be embarrassed. To consider school closures and consolidations now during a pandemic and outside their 10-year facilities plan is both callous and dumb. It's callous because families and teachers who are also taxpayers are already under erroneous stress, enormous stress, trying to make it through another lopsided, exhausting, disoriented school term. It's dumb because what kind of real data can county officials find that will be reliable a year from now? Enrollment is skewed because of the pandemic. Community growth is in progress, but slowed by the pandemic and economic difficulties. Changes in work modes now make it possible for families to relocate more easily and choose to live just about anywhere with good internet service. And real estate markets are more active now than in the last 10 years. Who knows? how long those conditions will last, and who knows what an economic recovery will look like in 2021. Why try to evaluate the long-term future of a community school during the most uncertain times we have had since World War II? Elected school and county officials have to make budgets work, but there is an unprecedented amount of federal money available to help schools and government agencies hit by the pandemic, more money than the average local family will ever see. Before officials eye up small schools as a source of savings, they best take a hard look at other pots of money. They also need to weigh the position they would be putting themselves in for the long haul if they make the wrong decision to call and close a school that later may need to be reopened or replaced. The people of Hancock are hard at work to make them see that big picture and won't stop anytime soon. I think that sums up the situation rather well. Uh, may I make a suggestion? that a copy of that be put in and attached to our minutes for the official record too, so to be online and part of our minutes. Is that okay? Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Kiefer. And That's all I have. Commissioner Wagner. Uh, good morning. Uh, I agree completely with what Commissioner Baker and what Commissioner Kiefer have said so far. I think we're missing something on Cascade and uh, Hancock. I think we all tended to save the school at I know we did at Hancock. In, in my life in real estate, I think parts of people don't understand the big part is the children, but the secondary part is my life revolves around people wanting to buy and open businesses where the schools are at. There you go. And, and if there's no school in Hancock or Cascade, who's going to move there? Who's going to open a business? I'm not particularly wanting to be in the business of crushing communities. And I know how this is going to get spun. It's going to be spun. The commissioners need to get more money. Let's keep the schools open. But I clearly think that, you know, right now we're giving 49. The tax, we're, they're, we're going to be called low effort. We've been called low effort every year. And frankly, they're calling the citizens of Washington County low effort. They're the ones that are taxed to keep this open. And at 49% of every tax dollar going to the schools now, I'm not opposed to helping as much as I can. But I don't want it, the burden clearly lies to me on the elected school board officials. Let's weigh out all these opportunities. Let's not crush these schools because nobody's gonna move there. Who's gonna open a business or move to a, a town that has no schools? They're not gonna do it. And just a little quick research I did, Clear Spring had at least 60 plus real estate transactions. So that's children involved there, I'm sure. I didn't do those statistics, but they try to close Hancock, we've already put 60 more real estate transition transactions you know that we're going to have a, it's clear spring will be overgrown and then we're looking three years from now to build another school like commissioner keeper said or smithburg's done 125 transactions real estate you know same thing applies there are we going to overload the school and then all of a sudden we got to build a school back around cascade especially with the potential of the fort ritchie being developed uh, that could increase a whole lot more school age children so there's a whole lot of things going on there that uh i think they've got to really i know they claim they have the studies and the commission and all that but there's a lot of things that really could crush a community at stake here not not to mention the kids are going to be on the buses for hours we've heard that and i know it's got to be true uh to the stadium again i agree with uh, commissioner Kiefer. i i i keep an open mind but i 
I personally don't want to own a stadium. I personally don't want to upkeep a stadium with taxpayers' money. And, and we have a building that sits right there about probably around home plate somewhere, one of those areas down there, that would cost just guessing three or four million dollars to relocate if we can relocate it that easily. So that's another that's another uh, concern I have. That's that's all I got. Okay. Thank you, commissioners. I wholeheartedly agree with just about every statement each and every one of you made. It is a difficult choice to close schools in a community, and I agree with my commissioners and support that every effort to keep those schools and all those locations open. Um, it's I know in 1968 when the old, old Williamsport High School was going to be torn down for the construction of the new Williamsport High School, which is now over 50 years old, I remember the excitement and the joy of our community uh, having a brand new school and some of the folks from the other areas being brought in and the friendships and the families that all were brought together because of this school. Coach Glenn Smith, Coach Stauffer, Mr. Price, uh, uh, Mrs. Waldron, Glenn Smith, Mr. Wadle, those memories of those teachers in my home school were very important. So I wholeheartedly encourage our local school board to keep those schools open. In regards to the ballpark and some of the statements, uh, I think the commissioners have been very fair and reasonable trying not to take a position. In our last meeting with uh, Senator Quarterman and others, it was clearly stated in the paper that we weren't taking a position. We were waiting for more details and facts on how the finances would be arranged. I have to agree, I do not support the county owning or putting any other taxpayers' dollars into that uh, project. If it's successful and can make money, good. Congratulations, let private business own and operate that stadium. In regards to the building on Baltimore Street, our permits building, You'd think by now we have been contact, would have been contacted with some type of preliminary offer that often takes place in real estate, that if you're proposing a project, we'd have some type of idea on what the price was going to be and where we're going to be located. At this time, when contractors pull up to that Baltimore Street location, they may be pulling a trailer, be in their work truck, so there'll be unique conditions set forth for a new location, so I think anything we should at least have been beginning in negotiations on what the cost and price of moving that building again i wholeheartedly support not having a position at this time waiting to see the finances if funding can be arranged to fully fund a stadium great congratulations behind that but i do not support our local tax money tax dollars from our taxpayers supporting that stadium in the future two other items before we begin our agenda I attended an event on Saturday for a veteran-owned business called J Dog Junk. The guy was a Iraqi War veteran with a, opening up a veteran-owned business. Congratulations and much success to him. And yesterday I attended the opening class ceremony for 33 firefighters at our academy. Best wishes to all those recruits and people who are going to be dedicated to protecting our community. With that being said, that will end my comments. And we'll go to staff comments. Krista, any staff today? I believe Dave Hayes has something to say. Okay, if Mr. Hayes, you're listening, please come in. I can't breathe. Good morning. I wanted to take a couple minutes here this morning. Um, Madam Clerk, I have a copy of what I'm going to speak to, so you don't have to try to keep up. <laughs> but to, to take a few minutes to brief you on the hiring initiative I heard uh, President Klein just speak to and uh, the beginning of the Firefighter Recruit uh, Academy. So Recruit Class 1, as you just heard, began yesterday, and it will last approximately 10 weeks ending around May 21st with the Academy graduation shortly thereafter. We'll uh, begin recruit class, recruit class one uh, with uh, actually 31 firefighters and firefighters paramedics. And of those, 26 are firefighters, five are the firefighter paramedic captains. Uh, just to give you a quick glimpse into what we're able to pull, because remember we're not hiring people or firefighters that don't have previous training, they have that. 
Uh, you now are employees of 25 <coughs> firefighters that are firefighter twos, 26 new EMTs, eight additional ALS providers, four of those came from within the county, 27 pump operators, and these are all in the 31 people, uh, 11 aerial operators, 24 rescue techs, 11 hazard, hazardous material techs, seven confined space techs, and five swift water techs. Out of all of those, only two do not have all of the primary job description uh, requirements. We will be working to fill those either through the academy or shortly thereafter that with details. Um, we're going to begin a second academy, which will be recruit class two, just after completion of the recruit class one. That academy will accommodate the fulfilling of the remaining seven firefighters and two captains that were approved under the regional staffing plan. We believe that we can actionize placement of the firefighters and firefighter paramedics in all the regional stations to include the firefighter and firefighter paramedics for both Hancock and Roarsville. Um, there will be limited leave impact capacity for the first 10 weeks until completion of recruit class two. Uh, so we'll likely need to use some overtime and things like that, w but with the delayed hiring of the staff, um, we should have that capacity in our existing budget. We'll also need to detail after completion of recruit class one and two, some of the firefighters to fill in some of the blanks to build the cadre up to add additional special operations strength. So in wrapping up, I just want to recognize <coughs> all the staff from the Division of Emergency Services team and other county staff who weathered many storms keep this hiring initiative on track and on time. Special recognition I would like to put out is deserving of the following DS staff and also county staff. In the Division of Emergency Services, Director Lewis, Captains Sharon Hardstock, Eric Yates, Programs Administrator Sonia Hoover, Administrative Assistant Bonnie Keltner, and Firefighter Tech Dave Olson. In Human Resources, certainly Interim HR Director Deb Kondo has had her hands full with us. Uh, Human Resources Coordinator Krista Shipley, HR recruiter Michelle Dwyer and benefit coordinator Brittany Rice, or Price, I'm sorry. And then in the Office of Budget and Finance is the Chief Financial Officer Sarah Greaves, Budget and Finance Director Kim Edlin, Accounting Supervisor Daryl Brown, Payroll Supervisor Stephanie Baker. And then certainly our County Leadership Team, uh, County Administrator John Monterano, and uh, County Attorney and former County <coughs> Administrator, Interim Administrator Kirk Downey. And then last but certainly not least, I want to thank you, the Board of County Commissioners, for your unwavering support of public safety in Washington County. While there's certainly more work to do, you have taken a huge step to ensure the sustainability of public safety throughout the county, and we appreciate your efforts. Dave, I was, when I was out yesterday, I have to commend your staff. I mean, it was very well organized. Yeah. Uh, it was like clockwork. You walk in there, everybody had their desk, if you saw in that last picture, they had all their gear, a lot of their gear, and not all their gear, but they had things that piled up on their desk with their names on it. And yeah. uh, and I guess Dr. clobber has been very cooperative in this. College has bent over backwards to the yeah. fullest extent they can, and certainly I missed that in this, but I want to extend the sincere recognition and appreciation to the Hagerstown Community College, also to the Hagerstown Fire Department for the use of their training center as we move through the physical agility testing, and then our neighbors to the East Frederick County Department of Fire Rescue who has extended use of their Public Safety Training Center for the practical evolutions of burns and, and those types of activities. So we're very fortunate here. We've got good friends and neighbors, and uh, that has helped us move this forward. And, and as you spoke, uh, I would be lying if I told you I wasn't a little nervous prior to yesterday morning, uh, but I knew on Friday what it looked like, and I felt great yesterday morning standing there and watching it, and I could sense the pride in the room for what they had achieved. And didn't you lose a couple instructors at the last minute? We did, and we had a, we've had challenges throughout the the entire planning process uh, in, in getting to this point. And that's why I felt it was important to recognize some of these people by name, because all of those had an absolute determination that we would not fail. Now we still have 10 weeks to complete the academy and I understand that, but I think uh, yesterday morning as you commissioner uh, had stated, and I think the cadets would agree, it was a well represented, a well planned class and I think we're gonna make this through and we're gonna do okay. So uh, again, remember, we had very limited staff to pull this off, but you know, I'm very proud of the work they did. Okay. Thank you, Director Hayes. Okay. Appreciate Commissioners, it. Any comments, thoughts, sir? Okay. Thank you. Krista, continue with staff comments. Anyone else scheduled? That's all. Okay, uh, Krista, would you have anything today? Yes, sir. Yes, sir.
Mr. Downey, would you have any comments today? No comments today. Thank you, David. Um, Administrator John Matrano, any comments uh, today? Just, just a few. Thank you, President Klein. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Um, first thing I want to do is I want to thank our water quality employees uh, for addressing and repairing a force main break that occurred on Sunday afternoon down in Westfield. Uh, they went down, took the station offline. Uh, there was no sewer service interruption for that community. Um, they actually were hauling some of that during the evening and they successfully repaired it yesterday. So I wanted to thank them for taking care of that. Just a few things, the mass vaccination site, as you know, uh, will open on this Thursday. So, um, and obviously the governor is gonna be opening it up more and more over the next few weeks. So uh, they're gonna start out slow at the mass vaccination site and then, and then ramp up. So uh, citizens who wanna be vaccinated that have not been vaccinated, uh, this is gonna be an opportunity in the next, uh, next three to four weeks to do that. Um, I did see Governor Hogan was gonna have a press conference today at 2.30 make additional COVID-19 vaccination announcements. I'm not sure what he's gonna talk about, but I just wanna let you know that was that was happening today. And the last thing, we've talked about it here. Uh, I just wanted to personally welcome the candidate, the, the candidate uh, at the Fire and Training Academy. Uh, I had the pleasure of being out there yesterday uh, to welcome them. Uh, it's a good group, uh, it's exciting. And I just wanted to personally welcome them to county government. That's all I have. Thank you. John, uh, those mass vaccination sites, when someone goes to get vaccinated, what information do they have to provide? Uh, first, an appointment, correct? I'm sorry? They have to have an appointment first, correct? Right, you're gonna have to have an appointment. So right now, I think they still have the pre-registration uh, site up and running. So uh, people go on and pre-register, and then when they become eligible, they'll be contacted to actually set up an appointment. As you know, I think it's today, 60 and above are now eligible uh, for the vaccine. And I think next week, I think it goes to, I think it's 16 and above with, with pre-existing conditions. And then I think the next week it's 55 and above. So uh, everyone just either look online. Um, they do have a, a centralized pre-registration site for those mass vaccinations. And as I said, they're gonna start out slow. I don't exactly know the number, but they're gonna start out slow here in Hagerstown and then ramp up very quickly as the vaccinations become available. That's, I mean, that's, that's the, the issue that they're gonna to continue to face. They, uh, more and more people are gonna be eligible, but until we get more vaccines, it's still gonna be a slow process. John, I might also add to that, if someone is eligible, not because of their age, but because they work in a designated employment category, um, they may need to bring proof of um, where they work and what they do, maybe an employee ID card if they work for uh, cool. an education. Correct, you're correct. Facility. Yeah, yeah, you're that's right. yeah I, I saw a registration link uh, to answer Terry. We, you're pre-registered and they call you for appointment. I, I don't know if did PR, maybe we could ask them, if they, they might have already done it to put it on our site, that link. I saw it once and then I haven't seen it since. Okay, we'll follow up with that. It may, yeah. it may be on there already. I mean, they've been following up. And I think the, the, the notices that they've been sending out from the Joint Information Center is included a lot of that information, but we'll make sure that we make that available for anyone who anyone who needs it. Great, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, no more staff comments. Hearing none, um, we'll begin with requests for reallocation of capital improvement projects. We'll welcome Jeff Prue, and I think I saw Dr. Michaels and Mr. Rollins there. Please introduce yourselves in the matter, please. Good morning. Good morning, commissioners. Good morning. Uh, on behalf of the Board of Education and the school system, I am here this morning to request the capital transfer uh, of project funding in the amount of $3,771,851, which constitutes the balance of the funding for the Sharpsburg Elementary School project and the balance of the, the uh, commissioner's funding for the urban improvement project to be reallocated to capital maintenance to support planned maintenance projects within the school system. Uh, specifically talking about the projects uh, in relation to the uh, to the new Sharpsburg Elementary School, uh, that project did come in under budget. Uh, the money that is requested to be transferred was part of the 2021 $4 million capital improvement project budget from the commissioners. And we would seek to apply that funding uh, to the local match of other projects that are uh, currently funded by, this, by the Interagency Commission on School Construction. As it relates to the urban improvement project, some history, 
uh, in early 2017, uh, the public school system, the Board of County Commissioners and others signed a multi-party uh, agreement uh, for the urban improvement project of which the commissioners provided $4 million towards the project and the Board of Ed provided $4 million to the project. Uh, and this is uh, specifically relating to the urban educational component, which is the addition to the Barbara Ingram School for the Arts, which is now the Vincent Roth Grow Academic Center. During the phase, or during the course of, of, of committee meetings and, and planning and designing, uh, I think the committee realized that uh, funding was not available to complete all of the projects. Uh, the board at that time, uh, in consultation with the team, uh, including at that time Senator Serafini, uh, requested to the Interagency Commission on School Construction for state funding on that project. Uh, with some additional support from the senator, also from the governor's office, the IAC did provide $10 million towards that project, which is uh, really what really was the grease that let the, the rest of the project keep rolling. Uh, the Board of Education had $2.5 million allocated to it from the governor's bond bill. A million and a half of that uh, was then not used and was allowed to be used by other partners on the project. Uh, and as a result of, of uh, successful design and, and value engineering, the board is under budget on that project and we are requesting uh, that those monies be transferred uh, to capital maintenance projects. Uh, and I think as a, as a point of note, uh, the transfer of capital money from large projects has typically been approved uh, to capital maintenance by the Board of County Commissioners. So I think this is a, a standard request on the part of the board. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions that you may have. Commissioners, comments, questions? Yeah, what's the, uh, you may have mentioned it, but what's the breakdown on each school, Barbara Ingram School was, and then what was the SHUP program after? Yep, so the, uh, just the county portion. The county portion of the UIP is one point, so I'll, I'll read it full out, $1,274,631. It's exactly half of the remaining allocation uh, between the board and the commissioners. And the uh, Sharpsburg project is, uh, is in the remaining, it's about $2.5 million. I believe, actually, you have a breakdown in your packet. Uh, I think uh, Sarah Greaves provided the county's transfer document. So the Sharpsburg amount is actually exactly $2,497,220. Okay. John or Sarah, where is our portion of this money sitting right now? Commissioners, any more comments or thoughts? Commissioners, if it's okay, I would like to suggest that we hold off on this for the time being as we go through our budget process. Um, we're close to finalizing our budgets. I know the Board of Ed is close to finalizing theirs. I'd just like to wait a little while, if that's okay. Commissioners, your thoughts on that? Look at why. Why as we go through the budget process? Okay. Have a, Dr. Michaels, please speak, please, sir. Come forward. I mean, I would ask the county commissioners to make a decision today. We're, we have a gigantic uh, funding matrix we're trying to sort our way through. We obviously have some federal money, just like the county has federal money. We're trying to shift and determine how to stretch and fill in our gaps in our general fund budget, our capital budget, um, our long-term capital budget, how to best utilize our federal funding. I mean, these are two big dominoes in what's gonna happen. This is gonna determine whether we have North High Turf or not have North High Turf. So these are dominoes we need to fall today, one way or the other, even if it's no. I'd rather know that today than to find out uh, anything different. The county's up 18.2 million in funding this year. I don't understand what it is to wait for. I don't know, understand what else is going to come in. Um, I would hope that you would find this favorable. This has happened year after year after year on these projects as there's been balances. Uh, we've been able to stretch those over into other capital projects. And 
these are two very important dominoes to me that I need to understand what's going to happen because if you're going to not provide this money, I've got to shift money from somewhere else to make sure that the projects that need to be funded are funded. And it causes other cuts and it causes other shifts in what we're doing. So we need to know, um, unless there's some real reason to wait, that the answer would be yes some other day. If the answer is no today, we obviously be willing to wait on the yes answer. But if you know that you're voting it up or voting it down today, we'd appreciate an answer. It really, we're, in, we're soon approaching April and we have to start making decisions on some of this budgeting method. And commissioners, if I can add, in relation at least to the Sharpsburg funding, that two and a half million was part of the FY21 four million towards capital projects approved by the IAC. So we have other projects, for instance, the HVAC replacement at Smithsburg High School, the roof project at Western Heights and a chiller replacement at North Hagertown High School, that if we don't have that money, those projects are unfunded and they don't get done. This money completes the funding for those projects. Uh, and it was in your FY21 budget. We're not asking for new money. We're asking for the reallocation to handle capital projects that need to be done. The HVAC system is original to the building at Smithsburg, circa 1967. The chiller is failing. We rebuilt it uh, several years ago at North High. Uh, it, it would ultimately be a reduction of your FY21 budget to in capital to the Board of Education if you deny this transfer on, on Sharpsburg. Commissioner Kiefer, are you still okay waiting? I am, sir. Is there anybody else in agreement with Mr. Kiefer to wait? Yeah, I'll wait. I'm, I, I'm don't, I don't think we're looking to deny. I think, I think we, I want to at least have a discussion with our CFO. And yeah, I think we're just going to wait. We're not saying no. All right, commissioners, y'all in agreement? We are. Right. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Next on our agenda, the adequate public facilities ordinance, school mitigation, Claggett's Mill, I believe Jill Baker, Jason, is this one Tim Lung's coming in on too? Or is no, that he'll, no, he'll be in on the uh, other one. Okay, next, gotcha. Next. Yeah, it's just Jill and Jason. Who are you waiting on? Um, Jill and Baker are coming in. I'm still touching it. Oh. <coughs> You're stretching already? Yeah. <coughs> Here, can you? I, I started to write it down. The, the road that you referred to in your comments, what was the name of that road? Mills Road. Mills, Mil Mills, Road. Mills Road. Okay, that's what, mm -hmm. I can't read my own handwriting, so I appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> M-I-L-L, -L, right. not M-E-L. Yep, I got it. Uh, if you'd like to wipe down your station to, just to be <laughs> safe. Good morning, everyone. Um, Jill, when you're ready, please introduce yourself, your guest in the matter. All right. Good morning, commissioners. Good morning. I am Jill Baker, Director of the Department of Planning and Zoning. With me today is Jason Dibelbis, Counsel for Claggett's Mill. Um, as you know, the APFO, or Adequate Public Facilities Ordinance, um, is the local regulatory instrument that we use to ensure that public facilities and services needed to support new development are available concurrently with the impacts of new development. In this specific case, we're here to talk about impacts upon school capacity. Claggett's Mill Section 2 is a proposed 100 lot subdivision located on the south side of Poppenberger Road, east of Sharpsburg Pike. It's located in the Rockland Woods Elementary, E. Russell Hicks Middle, and South Hagerstown High School school districts. Based upon uh, the latest available data that we use to compute school adequacies, Claggett's Mill Section 2 surpasses the local rated capacity at all three school districts. Typically, those developments that exceed the LRC may still move forward 
um, with their project by using the alternate mitigation contribution to mitigate their impacts. However, the APFO limits that mitigation method for developments that do not exceed over 120% of the state rated capacity. In this specific case, the school seats needed uh, to serve this new development would exceed 120% of the state rated capacity of South Hagerstown High School. Therefore, the developer has submitted a proffer mitigation in the amount of $334,530 to the commissioners to abate the needed mitigation. Uh, just to note that um, all the funds that have been collected uh, over the years through this alternate mitigation contribution are deposited into a designated account specifically for school construction costs. So um, with that, uh, I'd like to open it up to commissioners for any co questions, comments, or uh, discussion related to this offer. Uh, Jill, I do have a question. Uh, you said this goes beyond 100 this will put the schools beyond 120%? Are they currently at 120% capacity? Um, with the APFO, the way it stands, without this development, they are under the 120% threshold. I um, can't remember exactly where they're at. So how many students are they going to potentially, whatever the formula is you use, so how many students will be, this development will make how many these schools, how many students beyond 120%? So this development will create 22 new students, and I believe we calculated that would be seven or eight students over the 120% capacity. At all three schools? No, just, just at South yeah. High. Are those figures, what's the latest accuracy of those figures? Those are based upon um, development through uh, permits through December 31st of 2020. I mean, as far as this being over student population, because a lot of children went to private schools through this. So is that uh, real accurate? Yes. Um, the numbers, the enrollment numbers affected by COVID, um, we have analyzed those numbers. We are using December 2020 uh, calculations for this formula. Um, as it turns out, uh, the most affected schools are the elementary schools, as you would expect, with daycare, homeschooling, things like that. High schools have been relatively unaffected by the COVID numbers. According to our calculations, based upon enrollment numbers provided by the Board of Education between June 2020, which was the end, basically the beginning of the COVID situation, through uh, our most current numbers, which is December 2020, um, they've actually gained 13 seats in the high school level total. So we've not lost any. I don't know. I just sort of question those figures because, you know, everybody talks to their kids going to private school, they're homeschooling. And we uh, we're not, to the point, I don't think we're overloading the schools. That's just my. Thank I just you. don't know how up to date, how accurate that is because all you hear is classrooms now are, the, you know, their people at the sc private schools are full. And I'm not saying that's good or bad. I'm just saying, are we really overloading? Are we a couple percent over? Not that, you know, the, the fee is fine, but I don't think if we're only a couple over, you know what I'm saying? I can only base my figures on. Well, yeah, you got the figures. I don't, but I just, yeah. I'm just curious how up to date they are. They are current to December of 2020. Okay. Commissioner Baker, you had a comment? You I was just going to, you know, comments that I received from the community of South High is busted. So I have heard. But what number and what busting at the seams means, I have no definition of that. I guess my other question would be, so based on the numbers of overcapacity under the old APFO agreement, what would that dollar value be? Maybe Jason, somebody would know yeah. that. So the old APFO agreement, Claggett's mill was $21,000 per lot. And so that was a whole different structure. All right, so that was. I meant, I'm sorry, I meant oh. per student. Uh, so if she's saying that they're going to generate 20 kids, mm -hmm. 
wasn't there a uh, on, under the old APFO wasn't it based on a, a student versus no. or it was based on a lot? Yeah, so the old 2007 agreement was based upon a per lot okay. number. That obviously is a, basically it's an antiquated system that we have of the well, yeah, time yeah. era. Yeah, so the AMC the AMC when it transitioned to then be more of a per student uh, impact when we sort of got into the granular level of analysis there. So what? So that's three hundred and thirty four thousand that they're mitigating. How many what number of students would you divide into that? I want to get a per student call. Their proffer would be three thousand three hundred and forty five dollars and some change per lot. So divide that oh. by huh. twenty two students. The AMC calculation is what takes in the pupil, the per yeah. uh, seat capital cost and all those other variables. So if you're saying 20 students, to me, it makes sense to divide the 20 into the 334. Mm -hmm. But you're saying you want to do it per lot. I don't understand. I guess that what I'm having trouble understanding, if a lot is going to produce a half of a kid on average, well, obviously. The, point, right, the, the people generation rate. So, is 0.22, so it's about okay. a quarter. So per here's quarter. how we come up with the alter, alternate mitigation mm -hmm. contribution. It, it is um, the average cost of a school seat right now is $41,198.55 per student based on a lot of different variables that we throw into that. That's what we expect a, it, it to cost per seat to build a new school and it probably is a little bit more than that now. We then take that number and we divide it by the average life expectancy of a school. At this point, that number is 50 years. We then multiply that number by the average pupil generation rate for that development. In this specific case, that number would be 0.29. What we do is we average the pupil generation rate uh, for the different elementary, middle, and high school people generation rates to get the 0.29. We then multiply that number by the total number of years that a student is expected to spend in that school, which the commissioners recently raised to 14 years. That would include a pre-K year in those numbers. That gives us a per unit number of, for single family homes, $3,345.30 per home. We multiply that then by the number of units that are being proposed. In this case, it would be 100. So we have a nice round number of $334,530 being proposed. That would be the typical payment that we would accept to allow projects to move forward if they were under this 120% threshold capacity. The APFO simply states that once it exceeds that 120%, they can no longer just directly use that. They have to come talk to the commissioners first to discuss whether or not additional mitigation would be needed. So that is what we're here for today, is to discuss whether or not the commissioners feel as though additional mitigation would be needed because the additional 100 units from Claggett's Mill would then exceed the 120% state rated capacity as prescribed by the APFO. Well, using those calc, I'm going to complicate this. Using those calculations, what would be the additional mon money by using the calculations you just went through? There would be no additional money. Okay. That would just be what the alter alternate mitigation would be if they were below the 120. And this money goes into account with the county. Yes. And the county monitors it for the Washington County Public Schools. Yes. And that money can only be used to build a school, can be to repair a school. It goes into a capital fund. Um, so. And there are, or I understand there are limitations to that. If you want more details, I believe Sarah Greaves, CFO, is here with us. She could elaborate on that more if you'd like. I mean, you just, I, I guess the yes or no answer. Do you have to build a school, or is there other ways you can use that money if you're the Washington County Public Schools? It's just uh, capital we would use the Not put a roof on. Or a turf field. But you could. In addition or an outside classroom. I would have to review the language that all of the pupils in the school would be 
Okay. I wouldn't use it for portable classrooms. I think you probably would. Well, I mean, I can chime in here. I think the excise tax, I know in particular, has um, more guidelines as to how funds are spent. And, and these ATFO mitigation funds, I think, are a little bit different. I don't think there's as many constraints in the ordinance itself. Obviously, you know, you guys set the policy as to what you do with it. But the excise tax has that, uh, I think it's, I forget what percentage yeah. is, but it has that designation in there that it is to be used for specific capital. Yeah, right? Sarah explained Which to me. This one's a little bit different. Yeah, Sarah explained to me before the meeting that, and you're going to correct me, 350000 three. Oh, 345000 ish uh, dollars are allocated out uh, to the Board of Education in their capital budget via excise tax fund. So you have kind of two pots of money here, one to help with um, annual um, capital costs and one to kind of set aside for big ticket items. Like I, building a new school. I personally would be fine with it, only be for one reason, one reason at all. With all the new industry coming into Washington County, they're going to have to play, have a place to live. And these are, and I know inventory is so low in Washington County now, I don't want the people coming here to work living in another county, whether it be West Virginia. I want them to stay in Washington County. So that's sort of my logic yeah. on it. So. If I can add some additional context to that, I think that's a, that's a good point. You know, I want to go back, sort of in the way back machine. Claggett's Mill started off back in 2004. This is the same Claggett's Mill mm -hmm. that's been in and around for a long right. time. It started off at 238 homes. It went up to 264. It's come back down to 148. Right. Um, what we're talking about here is the final 100. There were 47 of the 48 in, in, in the, the original phase that have been built out. So they're pretty much done. So we're talking about 100 additional units in a project that at one point it was going to be 264. So it's already come drastically down from, from prior years. The other thing is that this project came before you in 2019 to ask that the previous APFO agreement be, you know, rescinded so that they could, this particular developer then purchased the project. They then developed the project. So all the infrastructure is done. The roads, the water, sewer, it's done. They're ready to start building homes. When they came and asked you to, to get rid of that old agreement, they were under the impression at that time, based upon the projected numbers at that time, that the AMC, this 3,345 per lot, was their route. There was not going to be an issue. The projections were all pretty modest on the schools. And then something happened between 19 and 20, not just with the enrollment at South High, but with the pipeline. So what contributes significantly to why we're sitting here today is what's referenced in the APFO as the pipeline enrollment. And that's basically the projected kids coming from previously approved subdivisions that have not yet been built. Right. So they're approved, but they're not built, so the kids aren't yet in the school, but you can see them coming on the horizon. When Claggett's got their preliminary plot approved for these 100 lots, that pipeline enrollment was 59. As we sit here today, it's up to 127. So the amount of units that have been approved in the last 18 months, primarily in Westfields, Hager's Crossing, and Rosewood, I believe, are the big needle movers here. That's the reason why it's South High is being projected at over 120. And it's it's a less than a 1% overage, which as Jill mentioned, it's we rough, roughly estimate that's about eight kids. So even all with all these projections, um, we're still not talking about a huge sort of margin over the 120. But that background, I think, is, is critically important. I'm not aware that any other project has gotten sort of stuck like this one has between a preliminary projection at preliminary plat and then a final projection at final plat that is so drastically different as to cause it to get stuck here. Um, when I've been here before with you guys, we've done this in advance for projects just coming in to get their approvals before they build the infrastructure. This is not that case. This project is built with homes ready to come out of the ground 
and has gotten stuck between the preliminary, which was okay, and the final, which is just barely over. So I think that's an important context to keep in mind. The other thing I, I referenced in the letter that I submitted back in January proposing this is that, you know, I don't mean to open up a can of worms with sort of county-wide discussions over redistricting and the like, but of all the high schools in Washington County, South High is the only one at this level. So based upon the current enrollment as of December of 20, Smithsburg's at 81, Boonesboro's at 79, Williamsport's at 83, and I think North is in, in the in the 90s. So South High is definitely unique with this particular impact. There seems to be room in these other districts. Again, I don't want to go there and say that that's the solution because with that comes a whole different set of complicating circumstances, but we seem to have a bit of a unique situation here with South with it, presumably it's caused by the development trend. And again, primarily those projects of large size, the Westfields, uh, Rosewood and Hager Crossing projects. So it's, it's a bit of a unique circumstance here. Um, and we would, you know, on behalf of the developer, we would just ask that the commissioners exercise the discretion to approve this offer so that this builder can get out there and get going. They would start tomorrow if they could. I mean, we'd, we'd pay that check and we'd get rolling and start adding these homes to the tax base. You know, I, I'm going to go ahead and make a motion to accept the developer offer for mitigation of school capacity for Claggett's Mill Section 2 development. There's a motion on the floor to accept. Is there a second for discussion? I'll second for more discussion. Thank you. First and a second discussion, please. Jill, how this process works, because the school's capacity is greater than 120%, they have to come into us for further discussions, correct? Is, yes, sir. Is that what you said? Do those discussions, can they involve negotiations uh, of additional money? Is that the, the premise of this? It's your discretion at what you want to do, yes. Okay. The $334,530 amount, that was based off of our county's own, own formula. Correct. Which we recently increased to include pre-K. So that, because we added another level of schooling, that increased that dollar amount as well, correct? Yes. Has an issue like this come before us in the past where we negotiated a different dollar amount? H how, how rare of an occasion is this? This is the first time we've had this situation <coughs> under the new policy of having the alternate mitigation contribution. Okay. What would the previous dollar amount before the alternative minimum contribution have been? Instead of 334, what would that value? It has varied over the years. Um, it has gone anywhere from, I think it started at $7,500 per unit, then it increased to $8,500, then what, it increased to... What would the to total been in 2018? That kind of what you're yeah. getting at, not the formula, but what would have been the total amount if this was 2018 instead of 2021? The alternate mitigation contribution came into play in 2014. Prior to that... Um, it was negotiated usually on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, the 120% did not play in here. It was just if you exceeded the state rate of capacity or the local rate of capacity, you would have to negotiate some formula. And that, that varied dramatically. Um, that, was, that was one of the ones that Claggett's Mill came in and we just rescinded. So you could go anywhere from $22,000 per lot I think we went the whole way down to $7,500 per lot. That was kind of the purpose of this AMC was to try to take out that uncertainty for developers and make our methods as consistent as possible. So that now that you know we're exceeding a larger capacity, then yes, that's, that's to bring it to your attention to say, hey, there's an alert here, we have an issue. How would you like to handle that? Do you think more money would handle that? Um, and if so, what that number would be, and that's entirely, you know, up to the commissioners to decide. Do we have the option to also, I, I know this project has been years under development. Do we also have the option, in addition to an additional dollar amount, to put a timeline on it? Because if other developments start to take place throughout the South Hager Sound High School do School District, for example, that 120%, 120.7% number could only go higher. 
Can we put a timeline on it to say, we, we will offer this to you at this amount, but you have to build and have your development done by a certain deadline. Is that possible? Jill, before you answer that question, do you know how many, I'm sorry, do you know how many other developments are in the pipeline for the South, Oaks, uh, South High School District that's going to add uh, large numbers of students to the campus? There is one development right now that is moving forward fairly rapidly, and that would be Hager's Crossing. However, that is in the city, and they have no APFA requirements, so that would continue to move forward. In the county, um, I don't so, believe. So, the, so Hager's Crossings, as that moves forward, it, they won't have to mitigate. No, they do not. So I believe in the county, um, we have at least three developments that are in a very, very draft preliminary concept form uh, that are interested in moving in down there. I don't think we have anybody ready to shovel ready at this point. No, we do not. Um, yeah, yeah. To come yeah. back to Commissioner yeah. Kiefer's question, um, the APFO does allow, and there's a statement in there about limiting um, the number of permits per yeah. year, if you'd like to do that. Um, I think... Call for a second. I'm listening to you. Um, I think that you could absolutely put a sunset clause on this. I mean, this is the negotiation that you're talking about. If you wanted to put a sunset clause, the only caution to that that I would put is that you're then um, allowing other developments to continue that have already paid the AMC and still continuing to put students in the school without that same sunset clause. So to be completely fair, um, it, it's something that can happen, but I, I don't know how consistent that would be with other developments that we've Commissioners, done. are there any more questions? Yeah, uh, in this in this part of the roulette form, um, yes. Yeah. Are, are the one of the properties yes. has a roulette drive address. So <laughs> yes. Are the roulette still involved with this project or they've already, it's all, you know. Okay, if there's, there's a first and a second, if discussion is over, I call for a vote to, to accept. All in favor, all, all in favor to accept. Say aye. 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 Four out of thank you very much. Jill, I don't need to go down a rabbit hole during our meeting here, but could you give us more information on the city has no APFO? Uh -huh. How that um, uh, affects us when we plan. Yeah, that's an important question. <coughs> Would you like me to bring that back to you in another discussion? Is that what you're asking? Or, or, you or like send an email. Or, or an email so we okay. can know. If you could just provide that information to the commissioners. Well, sure. If we, if we want to have a further them. discussion, we can do that after you get the preliminary information. I'll come back for that one, too. <laughs> I, everybody? Yes, I got thoughts on that one. <laughs> I was going to say, yes, you can. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you, Joe. Um, thank you. Joe. Thank you yes, thank you. How will the uh, cost of materials affect the development of this uh, development? Challenging. Challenging. I was out at uh, Lowe's yesterday, a sheet of OSB, just a four by eight sheet, $39. Yeah. How yeah. much? $39. Oh, oh my yeah. goodness. And, um, two by 10, about 10 bucks? Or a two by four, eight foot long, $8 and 31 yeah. cents. Crazy. I've talked to some, some builders that are now having trouble even getting it. Yeah. It sounds like oh, they have to quit building it's become a price them. issue. Now it's really turned into a supply issue as well. So it's, it's very concerning yeah. because there's a lot of the, um, the big scale builders okay. that are just buying it in mass quantity and gobbling right. the entire supply. It's going to slow down new construction. Okay, yeah. everybody, next agenda item will be the express approval, town of Smithsburg. Thank you, thank you Mr. Douglas. Jill, thank you. Um, Mr. Cross, you, uh, good day to you. You may want to wipe down your area just to be safe if you, there's some. From, from him? Yeah, you never know. You never know. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, J that's a, shaky that's a, JV law. I think. Oops. It's a very good idea. Um, thank you for your cooperation. Okay. Again, good out, or good morning still, everyone. Uh, our agenda item now will be the express approval, town of Smithsburg annexation. Joe Baker, will you introduce yourself, your guest, and the matter, please? Thank you, Commissioner Klein. Joe, before you started, Mr. Cross, I just confirmed the live feed is up and running. 
Okay, so I have Rich Heddington, mayor of Smithsburg, uh, on my cell phone saying he can't see, and I have Bruce Steen and uh, my attorney and uh, well, saying they can't see. So, well, I mean, the lot, the lot feed's running, and actually, commissioners, just so you know, the lot feed is right there in front of you. Thank you. That's the lot feed. So, I just confirmed with our staff sure. that the lot feed is running. Okay, thank you. I'll begin at your convenience. Thank you, Commissioner Klein. Um, my name is Jill Baker, director of the Department of Planning and Zoning. Joining me here at the table is Mr. Daniel Cross, um, owner and developer of Cloverly uh, Subdivision in Smithsburg. Um, presented today is a request to grant express approval of a development that has been annexed by the town of Smithsburg um, that has been assigned a zoning designation substantially different than that of the county zoning. The town of Smithsburg has recently approved annexation of two parcels located at 12214 and 12205 Cloverly Lane with a combined total of 1.57 acres. The current county zoning of the two parcels is residential transition and the town has applied a zoning of, of general commercial. As, it, as the two titles of the zoning district sound, the county zoning currently only permits only residential uses, while the town zoning will allow only commercial uses. While the, town, while the two zoning districts um, are acknowledged by all parties as being significantly different, there is some context that needs to be taken into account. These two parcels are, are intended to be combined with the larger Cloverly development that was previously annexed by the town, and I think you'll see that in some of your included information that Mr. Cross has provided. Um, the zoning assigned by the town uh, to the two parcels is consistent with their overall development plan, with the town's overall comprehensive plan, and that being contemplated by both the town and the developer. So based upon that comprehensive development plan, staff does recommend express approval uh, especially given that they are two smaller parcels that would likely be uh, incapable of additional development without being uh, added on to or included in additional development. I'd like to point out that the commissioner should have received via email uh, a letter of support from the mayor and council for this express approval. Um, they have, a, they have annexed the land and I believe it's still within that 45 day waiting period. However, um, they do support this. Uh, that concludes my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have um, and any discussion. Commissioners, thoughts, comments, questions for Jill or Mr. Cross? Did you read it? Yeah. Like for Jill, uh, yes. since all that additional land had already been voted on and approved for annexation, did these two parcels, or did these two parcels have like a public hearing to them or anything like that? Yes. This went through another separate annexation That's process right. whereby there was a public hearing. And then in your, I'm looking here now for the information on uh, opposition. Um, Mr. Krosky, can you, I, I can't recall, I don't but think there was. Mr. Baker, good afternoon. For the record, I'm Daniel Cross. I'm the owner of Cloverly Hill, LLC. Are we still putting addresses in the record? Yes. Um, 5301 Bucky's Town Pike, Frederick, Maryland, 21704. Uh, Mr. Baker, uh, recollect that although I own the Cloverly Farm Lane Road bed itself, and I owned the corner, and then by action of the Governor's Board of Public Works in 2018, I acquired the surplus right-of-way. The town back under Mayor Myers had always asked me to try to annex the whole corner to bring along these five homeowners. In 2014, Jason actually worked with them in detail and we got them to sign on to an annexation agreement, but the pound of flesh they wanted from the town was not satisfactory to the town. So I was kind of giving carte blanche, proceed to the annexation you last saw, which was the 2018 annexation of the vast majority of the parcel. And then as these homeowners have retired, offered their property to sale for me, I have bought them. So that was the purpose of this most recent annexation. The vote was 4-0 in the Smithsburg Town Council, and there was no opposition recorded in the record for that town council meeting. 
They said there was an advertisement for pu public participation and all that. It duly advertised and duly posted on the property. That's all I uh, indeed, twice, sir, um, because we had a 30-day hiatus between what should have been a hearing and then the hearing happening. So two notices in the paper, two postings on the property. Okay. Go ahead. I'm I was sorry. just going to say, based on that information, and uh, I didn't support the original annexation. I'm but aware of that, sir. <laughs> but based on that, and uh, that satisfies my, uh, my thoughts as to moving forward today with this project and uh, the annexation of it. So. Mr. Yeah. Baker, I've got to tell you that's a great relief Mr. to Mr. me. Mr. Baker, you want to make that a motion or the? Well, I think Randy had a question. Hey, Randy. No, you know what? Just go ahead and make the motion. Yeah. So, well, do you have any other questions? So, right. Okay. Uh, yeah. Based on all the information provided and uh, based on the uh, public hearing with uh, no comments, no opposition, uh, I'll make the motion to support the right. recommendation as stated. Very good. Is there a second? Yeah, I'll second it. Uh, first and second to approve. Is there to grant? Is there any other discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all. Good luck. You're welcome. Didn't even have to get to my to my speech. Glad to be back. Well, Look forward to seeing you again whenever we next need to. I saw the first hand out there that you provided today, and that pretty much answered all my questions. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And Thank you for luck. your patience and time. All right. I believe next up is the application for zoning map amendment. For Frank and Catherine Murray, Joe Baker, welcome back. Please introduce yourself in the matter. Uh, good morning again, Jill Baker, Director of the Department of Planning and Zoning. Uh, I am here today to present to you a request for a full termination of a rural business floating zone on property located at 14025 Greencastle Pike. Um, this would be, uh, with the removal of this, it would then uh, revert back to the underlying zoning of rural village. Um, regulations regarding the application and removal of floating zone districts are different than those that we typically look at with Euclidean zones. Um, instead of following the change or mistake rule, um, we simply bring forward the request uh, and why they are requesting the removal of the zone. And then the commissioners uh, may make a decision without public hearing uh, and with a planning commission review and recommendation. Um, this request was reviewed and recommended for approval by the Washington County Planning Commission at their regular meeting on March 2nd, uh, 2021. The applicant's letter and an exhibit has been provided to you along with the staff report in your packet. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have at this time. Jill, uh, so basically they just want to make it a residential. Yes, they want to remove the commercial element of the zoning and revert back to residential. Uh, Commissioner, I'm very familiar with this. I actually long time ago had it for sale. It's, it's, it's a challenge for commercial uh, with septic and you know it's, there's not enough room to put big septic uh, and these are just some of the old that you could develop that in uh, so many people in there today. So uh, I'm very familiar with that motion to uh, accept that. Okay, there's a motion. Is there a second, second. for discussion? There's a second. I'll, I'll support this as well, just out of curiosity, and mm -hmm. Randy, you might know. Was this used as a, a car lot at one time for like antique cars? I don't believe it was an auction house. It was a church, a flea market. I don't think, I, I don't recall. I remember that. some antique cars there at one time. Maybe it was, they were Maybe up Maybe just auction. a day event or something. Yeah. yeah. Okay, commissioners, I have first and a second. Um, is there a motion to approve? All in favor say aye. I mean, excuse me. There's first and a second. All those who approve say aye. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Jill. Thank you, Commissioners. Next up will be the Governor's Office of Crime Prevention, Allison Harris Hartstorn. Allison, good morning. Please introduce yourself in the matter. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Allison Hartshorn, Grant Manager, Office of Grant Management. Um, this morning I'm here seeking the approval of the submission of the FY22 Community Partnership Agreement proposal to the Governor's Office of Crime Prevention, Youth, and Victim Services, requesting $661,103 and accept the funding as awarded. 
Um, on behalf and at the direction of the local management board, the Office of Grant Management requests the approval to submit an, a proposal requesting funding for six programs impacting the well-being of children, youth, and families in Washington County, as well as support the county administrative ex expenses. Um, I have a breakdown of the funding requested by the local management board includes the following programmatic strategies and the respective vendors. Um, Family Center Support Services with the Department of Social Services for $70,940. School-based mental health services um, provided by Brooklane Health Services, $203,925. Disconnected Youth Program Enhancements, Western Maryland Consortium, $60,938. The Family Strong Program, Potomac Case Management Services, $81,020. True Opportunities Program, also Pot Potomac Case Management Service, excuse me, Potomac Ma Management Services, $81,020. And the Local Care Team Coordinator, Praxis Access LLC, $54,000. And last but not least, the Office of Grant Management Administrative Expenses, $109,260. Um, the fiscal impact for the county, will it will provide $109,000 thousand two hundred and sixty dollars to the office of grant management any questions you want us to approve the submission and yes, the approve the submission and um, accept, accept the, the award. Uh, yeah commissioners comments thoughts i have a question sure. Allison, um out of curiosity the grant will provide one hundred nine thousand two hundred sixty dollars most of the for us to administer the grant most of the organizations aren't even receiving that much why why is our Expense so high. Could that money better? Um, be a better I could get back to you on. I could find out exactly why. Um, why we ask exactly that amount. Um, I think there is a certain um, percentage that we get out of the grant money that we are provided. Um, the only one the state gives us so much money. The only one that's not in that is the local care team coordinator. We ask above and beyond that. So they give us a set amount and then we break it down that way. And that's how the, um, the board goes with it. Um, and they have approved it that way, but I can look back and find out if there's a exact breakdown. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. I'll make a motion to approve the grant application and accept what is funded. Is there a second? Second. A first and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Thank you very much. Thank you. Next up, Black Rock Golf Course. Andrew Eichemann, if you're listening, come on in. He's out there. <laughs> Gentlemen, good morning. Please good morning, introduce yourself in the matter. Andrew Eshelman, Director of Public <coughs> Works. Dave Brooks, Park Supervisor. We're here before you this morning uh, seeking a recommended motion to combine the current grill cook grade four positions and the restaurant server grade one positions into a combined grill cook and server grade one position at the Black Rock Golf Course. The grill cook is a position that's located at the Black Rock Golf Course and primary job responsibilities include preparing and serving food in the clubhouse. The server position uh, was a position that delivers the food and mostly runs the beverage cart out on the course, uh, but that position has not been utilized for, for years. Currently we have three part-time grill cooks and four part-time restaurant server positions, and we're proposing to combine those into seven part-time grill cook slash server positions to create a flexible pool of employees to cover the operating hours. Uh, the job responsibilities and grade have been reviewed with respect to similar jobs and this adjustment is proposed. Um, I'll note since April 2020 due to COVID restrictions, the Black Rock Kitchen has been scaled down and we currently don't have any one employed as a grill cook or a restaurant server, so there'd be no employees um, affected by the proposed change. We have done some food service and this was um, prepared and sold by our grade one pro shop workers and the golf course manager. Um, normally, the grill cooks double as the servers, 
and so they do receive tips. And so when factoring in their grade four base pay and tips, the equ equivalent hourly rate is significantly higher than the job responsibilities and comparable positions, not only at BlackRock, but also when we look at positions like at the uh, Marty Snook pool. And so we're, we're recommending that um, as we hire grill cooks and service reopen the kitchen, um, that they focus on good customer service and tips should be factored in as part of the compensation. And as we said last week, we're in here talking about part-time wages. Um, once the minimum wage rises to $15 an hour, uh, potentially the grill cook position on an hourly rate would proportionally increase more than other positions, creating even more disparity. So we're recommending that this adjustment happen now uh, before we advertise and hire employees for the position. And I would add that the uh, board out at BlackRock like the like the proposal from our last meeting last week. Dave could answer any questions on how the operation would actually right. work, but that's the overall concept of what we'd like to do. Motion to approve it for agenda. I'll second. I have a first and second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, Highway and Water Quality Departments, Andrew Eichemann, Mark Bradshaw. Please introduce yourself in the matter. Welcome back, Andrew. Thank you, Andrew Eshelman, Director of Public Works. Mark Bradshaw, Director of Environmental Management. <coughs> uh, we're here before you to seek a recommended motion to approve the execution of an amendment to the Memorandum of Understanding, the MOU, between the Board of County Commissioners and the Maryland Public Employees Council 67, AFSCME, AFL-CIO and its local 2677. Um, AFL-CIO to Article 22, which is the posting of jobs internally for the affected departments. The current MOU states that job openings within the bargaining unit only shall be posted or advertised internally um, within county government for a period of five business days prior to being advertised outside of county government. Such job openings will be advertised externally only if no qualified internal candidate applies during the referenced five-day period and is thereafter selected for the job opening. So that's the direct quote. Uh, so this in combination with transfer requests results in hiring delays and duplication of advertisements for entry-level positions. And the county has come to an agreement with ASME to streamline the hiring and transfer process that still maintains the internal hiring preference for higher grade positions. So basically what we're talking about example here is say in highway department position opens up in Keysville, that's an entry level position, it gets advertised internally, somebody from central may decide they want to move there, they go through, they, they take that position, now we have a position that opens up in central, the process repeats, and it takes a long time to work through all those steps to where we actually have people uh, coming on board to fill those positions. So this is an effort to, we work with the union to kind of streamline that so transfers can happen uh, more expeditiously and we can have a pool of external candidates to um, fill wherever the remaining opening spot is within county um, uh, highway department. And then we looked at water quality as well for Mark's entry level <coughs> positions. So I mark you know, an the, example uh, of how that would be on your side. The, uh, the union employees council has been involved in the process and they approve it? Yes, we had, uh, I think, bi-monthly meetings and so this was something we talked about, the hiring process. Um, Carol I'll Braun. I'll make a motion to approve it. Okay. There's a first, there's a second. A second. A first and a second, any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Thank you, John, appreciate it. Thank you, thank you, Andrew. Thank you. Next up, fiscal year 2022 water quality budget. Welcome back, Mr. Bradshaw. Introduce yourself in the matter. I and I believe Sarah's a joiner. Sarah's joining us. Good morning, Commissioner. My name is Mark Bradshaw, Director of Environmental Management. Good morning. Good morning. Sarah Greaves, Chief Financial Officer. Um, we're here today to go over the budget for water quality. The water quality fund includes the utility fund, water fund, sewer fund, and pretreatment fund. Something important to keep in mind related to these funds is that they share employees and therefore wages and benefits are allocated based on prior year between the funds. First, we'll go uh, through the utility fund, which provides 
supportive services to water and sewer operations of the Water Quality Department. Services provided include administration, laboratory testing, maintenance of vehicles, and utility facilities. A budget increase of $401,000, of which $365,000 is related to wage and benefits, $53,000 related to operational costs, mainly as a result of a lease program for a mini excavator, software, port contracts, liability insurance, and utilities. Capital outlay, outlay decreased by $17,000, which re represents less funding dedicated to capital projects than last year. Uh, next, we'll talk about the Stormwater Management and Watershed Department. Budgeted at $422,520, saw the largest increase due to new positions for the MS4 compliance. This department is fully supported by the general fund and not supported by water and sewer rates as duties and functions of the department could be housed under the general fund as they are in other jurisdictions. Uh, the Clean County Department budget at 203000 is supported through stormwater retrofit projects in an effort to meet the needs of the N NPDES permit in most effective manner. Do you have any questions on the utility fund? Okay. Uh, next, we'll talk about the water fund. The water fund increased by $75,780, of which $48,000 is related to wage and benefits, $28,000 related to higher operational costs, mainly as a result of increase in the amount of funding being transferred to the utility fund. Supply and material maintenance also increased by $7,500. The water fund continues to face an operational shortage and will require general fund subsidies of $187,280. This shortage includes an assumption <coughs> rate of 3.5% increase. And commissioners, just to interject, the water fund summary starts on 16-1 in your packet that you have. Just in case you're looking for that. What's, uh, what was that number? 16-1. 16? 16-1. Yeah, it's getting tough with 800 pages here. But <laughs> it's a lot of documentation. I'm just kidding. Uh, if no re rate increase is approved, the general fund subsidies will be higher than previously stated. We have also included TAP fee increase for 22 to be raised from $2,500 to $2,700. Also, we have looked at operational efficiencies to try to decrease the cost associated with the water fund. Um, a couple of those projects are we connect the Cascade water system into the high field water system. So now the high field water system supplies all the water to Cascade Town Center, which reduced us from having to operate separate water treatment systems. We're also looking at drilling a well down in the Sharpsburg area. Um, we've been in contact with the town. The town owns the property there at the ball field. They actually drilled a well several years ago and it uh, has very good production rate and the town has agreed to allow there's us the possibility of drilling a well down there too. There, there's a pardon me, there's a high cost of drawing water off the river for treatment down there. Is that yeah, correct? Yeah, sur surface water has a higher operational cost than uh, right. groundwater. And there's eventually doing the well would lower that cost. Is that would that be a good? That is the idea that we're pursuing that it would lower our operational costs associated with the Sharpsburg water system if we can drill this well and it produces one weed. well, maybe two wells, or Wait to see. Wait and see. Um, like I said, the well they drilled was very productive. I think it was 50, 60 gallons a minute to yield. Um, we are planning on going down and sampling that water and determining what the quality is because that would have a direct impact on the treatment processes too. So uh, we've been in contact with Russ Weaver, who's now the mayor, and we will be going down here very <coughs> shortly to pull those samples and analyze them. Yeah. And if everything checks out, then we will probably be contacting the town about actually getting permission to drill well on their property. Thank you. And Please. they're extremely excited about this project down there in the Sharpsburg community. Uh, Mr. Weaver yes, indeed. keeps emailing oh, yeah, me yeah. wanting to know he, when I'm coming down. I think he wants you yeah. to drill three wells. And that, uh, that's going to help cut the cost of the water cost yes. to the citizens in Sharpsburg. Uh, do you have an idea? To 
the range of uh, cost reduction? Not yet. We haven't explored it that far yet. Um, once we do the analysis of the water, then we will actually start doing some engineering cost analysis, what it's going to cost to drill the well, what it will cost to, we'll have to put up like a little building, maybe a, a but, 10 to 10. But after 15. the initial cost that could be cost savings compared to the ever rising cost of treatment yeah, the surface water. Mm -hmm. once, from what I understand. Yeah. Then we'll do all those cost analysis and I'm sure um, if you want I can send them to you once I get everything compiled and we'll see what the uh, upfront capital cost is and then we'll look at the treatment cost and then ultimately a, a break even analysis to determine whether we'd have to operate the well <coughs> two years or three years to break even versus treating water from the river. So we are exploring that, and we will continue to explore that option. Would the well provide be the exclusive water source for the county? No, it would not be the exclusive. It would be a supplemental. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'd love to get an exclusive well that produces that kind of water, but uh, right now our treatment is around 100,000 gallons a day is the usage in Sharpsburg. That would be a, a really good well if we could do it. And I think their well is uh, 50 gallons a minute somewhere in that neighborhood. So we use the well as a supplement, maybe third or fourth, up to fifth extent, depending on uh, what the actual well produces. Okay. Thank you for that. Please um, continue. Uh, do you have any questions regarding the water fund? No. All right. The sewer fund starts on 17-1. So back to the water fund, what are going to be the, uh, the rate increase recommendations? Do you have any idea on what they're going to be? Yes. We do. We can go over those now, or we can go over them at the end um, of the you presentation. You going over them today? Yes. Okay. Yes. And then just okay, follow wait, your agenda. Wait to the end, okay? Yeah, Thank you. They have planned. All right. Uh, next is sewer fund. The sewer fund increased by seventy-eight thousand one hundred thirty dollars, mainly due to increases in wages and benefits of forty-five thousand dollars. A decrease in operational expenses of one hundred eleven thousand, mainly due to debt service, and an increase in CIP projects that required cash funding. Fund balance of 626,000 is being used to bridge the shortfall. The budget does include a 3.5% rate increase. 3.5% generates an additional $331,000. We have also included a tax fee increase of $300 from 6,900 to 7,200. We would like to bring the commissioner's attention to the joint service agreement with the city of Hagerstown for the Hagerst Crossing uh, Weissel Boulevard area will be ending in approximately two years. Uh, the city plans to build out the improvements to their plant and take over their customers as full service. Currently, the city of Hagerstown pays the county a wholesale rate for the flow. Once it's transferred to the city, a full service customer sewer revenue will uh, be reduced by approximately $500,000 a year. This assumption has been added into the rate model projection. Any questions on the sewer? I was going to say, I was gonna say that's, that's new information that we just received, right? That, just that new is new information. New As information. of last year, we had not assumed that in the rate model. We were not aware of the reduction the in revenue. The city has just recently announced that they were going to build yes. out their infrastructure again. That's correct. So just, just so everybody knows, this is new. They've already adjusted it. And Mark have already adjusted, and that's what they're talking about today. That's right. Uh, the last fund is the pre treatment fund. The pre treatment fund was privatized in 2006 through a long term lease. As a result, operational functions are no longer the responsibility of the water quality department. This privatization allowed the county to maintain compliance with EPA regulations at a substantial saving. The cost and fund is debt service of 400 and $84,700. Lease payments are made in the amount of $345,000 and the remainder is drawn from fund balance. Any questions regarding uh, the pre-treatment? Okay, uh, now Sarah's turn to talk about the rate. All right, good morning commissioners. Water and sewer revenue requirements show that an increase and water and sewer revenue is necessary to facilitate the Department of Water Quality's long-range financial plans. The presented rate schedule that you have is based on this requirement. It is attached to the ARF. There is a um, 
a rate sheet right before you get to the next agenda item, which is the airport budget. So if you skip to the end of your packet, you should be able to find the proposed rates. What number would that be? It right is after, after 18.5. Yes. The would be numbered at right after 18.5. Looks like this. Thank you. Does everybody have the rate sheet? Find it. Okay. So I'm going to go through the rate increases that are being proposed, um, and then I'll talk to you a little bit about the water quality rate model. For the water fund, or I guess we can start with sewer. It's sewers first. Yep. For the sewer fund, we have a residential full service customer for the base rate increasing by 2%, which is $2.61. Commercial one by 3.5% or $4.67. Commercial two by 3.5% or $4.76. Commercial three by 3.5% or $4.76. Volunteer by 1.3% or $1.69. And the collection service by 3.5% or $2.10. Keep in mind these base rates are for um, quarterly uh, billing. Um, in addition to that, we have increases related to the volume. For residential full service, you'll see an 8%, which is equal to 0.60. Commercial one, 3.5%, 29 cents. Commercial two, 3.5%, 33 cents. Commercial three, three and a half percent, 23 cents. Volunteer, eight and a half percent and 64 cents. And the non-metered accounts at three and a half percent or $6.14. Wholesale customers, three and a half percent or 27 cents. Um, you probably were looking at the increase for residential full service under the volume charge for 8%. I'd like to draw your attention to the bottom of the rate sheet where it has the charge for 12,000 gallons per quarter for the average residential customer. This year, the rates that are being proposed are less for the base charge and more for the volume charge. This is in accordance with the rate model projections. And what this will do is it will um, only increase those customers who use the base or less by 2% or $2.61. And those who use the average 12,000 gallons would increase in overall 3.5% or $6.21. So overall, the rate increase being proposed is average at 3.5% or $6.21. But if they use less than the 6,000 gallons per quarter, they will not experience as large of an increase. So you could assume maybe older residents who don't have a family. On a fixed income. Gets to bathe every night. They generally That's only correct. use the base, so they would only see a two dollars and sixty-one cents per quarter increase. And look at, uh, explain what a volunteer service. Those are just related to our volunteer companies, um, and as you're aware, the county reimburses um, those companies in full for their utility costs, um, and so in a roundabout way, that cost does enter the county. What this is trying to do with the 1.3% increase for the base charge and the 8.5% increase is align those rates with the residential rates because the rate model suggests that they should be the same. And so what we're trying to do here is an al alignment of those rates. So when the volunteer services company says, even though they have an increase here, we're not gonna fund them back for what they have. Yes. We reimburse those costs. Any other questions on sewer rates? Okay, we'll Sarah, move. Yes. Um, I'll wait until you're finished. Okay. Um, water rates are structured very similarly. The residential full service, um, the proposed rate is 107.15, which is a 2.3% increase or $2.39. Commercial one, is the 3.5% increase, or $3.67 of an increase. Commercial two, 3.5% increase, $4.53. Volunteer, 2.3%, or $2.37. And then on the volume side, residential full service, 5.3%, or 62 cents. Commercial one, 3.5%, or 42 cents. Commercial two, 
three and a half percent or 33 cents and volunteer 4.9 percent or 58 cents with the non-metered accounts at three and a half percent increase as well at six dollars and eleven cents if you look to the bottom you'll see the average twelve thousand gallons per quarter for, per av average residential customer <coughs> comes to the base charge of a 2.3 percent increase or two dollars and 39 cents for those who use less than the six thousand and then for the average customer the volume charge is increasing by 5.3 percent or three dollars and 72 cents overall again you see the three and a half percent increase at an average of six dollars and eleven cents per quarter Based on rate model projections, race, rates must increase in order to offset general fund contribution in the water fund and to get sewer back to a self-supported status. Currently, expenditures do exceed revenues by 187,000 in the water fund and 626,000 in the sewer fund. Are there any questions on water rate increases or rates overall? These go to public hearing, correct? Yes, we are going to request today to advertise to take these rates to public hearing. So on average, if somebody's on county water sewer, their rates are going to increase approximately $100 a year. You said these are based on quarter? These are based on quarter. So if it's an average, average of $6 a quarter for so water and sewer. $48. Right, 48, 48. Right. Technically about 50 bucks a year. That's if you use the 12,000, but if you use less than that, it's uh, two. I, I two. just said average. I just said okay. Average. Sarah, um, this is helpful. That you can't yes, let me let me just go over this. I'm sorry this was not attached to the ARF. What I, what I put in front of you were the um, rate model projections um, for the 10-year plan for both the water and the sewer fund. So let's just take a look at the water utility at first. You'll see at the top, one is named water utility and one is <coughs> named wastewater utility. So if we start with water utility and you look at the highlighted um, figures, you're gonna see for the 10 years an annual surplus or deficiency. So I just wanna bring your attention to this because even with a 3.5% increase per year for water, um, we do see a substantial increase or deficit, I guess, in the fund, which would increase the general fund contribution to that fund. So for instance, in 22, it's around 190,000. In 23, 200,000. If you skip to 2031, you're at 466,000. So at this point, we're um, exploring the options that Mark discussed to try to reduce this um, and to try to get it back to a self-supported status. I'm not sure. Um, you know, we can't speak about it yet because we don't have the cost analysis done, but that is the hope. But in absence of a restructuring of how we're providing the water service, we will continue to see an increase, and currently it's funded by the general fund. If you go to the next page, it's entitled Wastewater Utility. So this analysis set up the same way. You can see the annual surplus or deficiency uh, for fiscal year 22 is around 750000 <laughs> um, and then from there, it increases to a deficit of about 1.2 million, but then you can see it decreases substantially. That decrease is directly related to the capacity management project and the additional customers that the county will receive from the completion of that project. The estimated revenue increase to the county is around 1.3 million once that project is built out. Keep in mind, we will then have the offset from the reduction in revenue from the city of Hagerstown of the 500,000, so. Um, That's factored in here as well? That is factored in here this year. Last year, we were not aware of the 500,000 loss in revenue, um, and so only the 1.3 million was factored in last year. So it, it is a hit to the rate model overall, uh, but it is factored in here. Sarah, and you can see at the bottom, go ahead. I'm sorry, go ahead. You can see at the bottom um, the rate increases that are um, utilized to create this projection. So if you change those rate increases, you will change the annual <laughs> surplus or deficiency that is also up top. But what we tried to do was align these rate increases so that at the 10 year period, the target balance, which is the 25% um, of operating and maintenance cost, which is around 2.9 million, 
equals or is very close to the ending balance. And so if you look at year 2031, you can see 2.9 versus 3 million. It's very close. Um, and that's with a staggered and reduced rates later on. But you do see the 3.5% rate increase as a potential increase for the next three years, 22, 23, 24, four years, excuse me. Um, yes, sir. I wonder, looking at your model for projecting and recommending a, a rather steady increase uh, fiscal policy, not growth of water and water related budgets, would it provide any benefit or stability to this future model through the multi year plan, or is this have to be considered only? I actually think a multi-year plan would be really helpful. Um, it, would, it would provide more guidance to staff and it would, um, it, 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 I think it would be a good thing. The city of Hagerstown provides a multi-year plan and they have, um, they have approved increases on their end for, I think it's a five-year period, don't quote me, but um, I think that would actually be very beneficial to the county. Okay. I, I mean, I, I agree, I think that would be, as we try to plan for the next 10 years, yes. I think that would be that would be a great thing, whether we do it this year right. or whether we do it in future years. I think that would be that would be helpful to the it would be helpful to, to us, helpful to staff, and helpful to the citizens. Yeah, know what what's we they can plan they for that. They, they know what's coming. coming. Well, I, think I think it's a good idea. That, I think what that would do, and this is just my opinion, I think that what that would do, that would limit the citizens' participation, citizen input, and I'm interested in citizens' input because you never know what uh, – they may have some valuable comments and by valuable things to add uh, as we decide this every year. To follow up with, pardon interrupts, follow up with an agreement, would there be uh, requirements for public hearings every year? You know, we do a multi-year plan. That's kind of where the input comes in, correct? Yeah. If we approve the three-year plan, would every year we'd also go to public hearing with the approval of that multi-year plan? Because if times do uh, get hard, I'm sure we're going to have to sit down and make some adjustments to this because we just can't keep adding more and more cost. I understand their users and so forth. But for me, I'd like to give direction and say, hey, get your budget cut to this amount. I mean, the way we're going, it would just keep automatically just increasing the cost to the customers. And that eliminates a lot of uh, work on our staff's part to try to get these costs reduced. That's just my thought. Yeah, I'm going to follow up on Terry there. We can still do a multi-year plan. That doesn't mean we approve it, correct? We still can I think there's two ways you could go. Correct, you but could every year we come back with the public hearing. Well, that's what we're doing here. Though. Yes. Um, I have another question, too, unless someone. Uh, I, mean, I, I was, I was just, just going to say that I think that uh, I think you would, that's what you started to say. And, and we can come back to that. But you know, I think there are ways you could do it. You could adopt a multi-year rate structure, or you could at least come up with a you know, some thoughts about it and see if you're going to do it every year. Uh, okay. and, and I'll just say this. I think that, I mean, our staff, we've already been talking about, it. we we will, we are continuing to look how to, co how to cut costs or how to do it better. And in the past so 12 months, we have um, reduced the staffing at Water and Sewer um, by several positions, which had an impact of about a $500,000 savings to the fund. So we are reducing staffing where possible to Not make we'll adjustments. So we'll, I mean, we'll continue to do that. I'm sorry. Okay, yeah. I, I want to go back, and I'm going to steal Commissioner Wagner's favorite quote. In 100 words or less, <laughs> review the $500,000 loss of revenue so the <laughs> average person who's listening right now can understand what that really means, uh, please. We currently have a joint service agreement with the city of Hagerstown. The city of Hagerstown um, pays the county at this wholesale rate that you see in the rate structure for the flow of those customers. In about two years, the city of Hagerstown has a plan to build out their pump station, pump station um, and so that they can take those Is that called the North End Flow Agreement, or is that the nickname this is for that? It's a different agreement. No, the a different flow one. transfer agreement. Okay, it's thank you. Pardon the interruption. Flow transfer agreement. And so in about two years, once their pump station has been upgraded, they will take those customer, customers on full service. And so they will no, no longer need to pay the county for the flow. 
and they pay us approximately four hundred fifty to five hundred thousand dollars annually for that wholesale that will now be diverted to their full service customers the county won't get the revenue so that agreements being renegotiated or is that agreement in then that agreements already exist it has a sunset clause in it of August of 23 um, but we are reviewing the JSA and it will be incorporated into the new agreement with the condition that they can take their flow back at a later date when their station is completed. Okay. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Commissioners. And do we have approval to take these rates to public hearing or to advertise for public hearing? Move it to public hearing. hearing. Yeah, I see. No, yeah, it's good. Thank you very much. Hearing that'll be virtual, or are we going to be? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we well, were, you know, we're still talking about how we're going to do public hearings moving forward. Right. There uh, should be some sort of public uh, input on a virtual. Will, there, where they last year when we did know. the public hearing, we allowed it open for seven days for public comment to come right. in in a variety of ways. Is right. there enough time to put a notice on utility statements for citizens to know that it's it's a little different this year? Um, for rate users. We could, but the way that those utility statements go out, all customers are on a different schedule, so it probably wouldn't reach all of our customers. Okay. Um, we may want to focus on um, Facebook and... Um, or or right, media. We right, we'll, we'll, right, we, we, we'll, work with, we'll work with PR and our departments to, mm -hmm. to get out the word in you know, all the different ways we can do it. We, can, we probably can't do it on the notices. That's why I hear what you're saying, but right. uh, on the rate notes. But whatever other way we can do, uh, including we can continue to discuss it here. Um, but yeah, social media and we can issue releases, however, however else we can do that so we can get what you want to tell them. Yeah, I just know if we did that, it wouldn't reach everyone because of the billing cycle. And I'd mm -hmm. have to talk to staff about how long it would take to get that set up because it's a process in the system, but. Mm -hmm. All right. The rate didn't increase last year. I'm sorry, Terry, what? The rate increases last year. What were they? Is that what you're asking? Zero percent for water. Water was not increased last year, and it was three and a half average for sewer. Commissioners, any other questions? If not, thank you, folks. Thank you. Thank you. We'll proceed to the next agenda Go item. Ahead. Will be the fiscal year 2022 Hagerstown Regional Airport budget. Garrison, welcome. Please introduce yourself in the matter. Good morning, Commissioners. Uh, my name is Garrison Plusner, Director of the Hagerstown Regional Airport. I uh, wanted to come before you today uh, to discuss the uh, airport budget for FY 2022. Um, a little report in brief is the Hagerstown Regional Airport contributes to the economic base of Washington County by providing and supporting air transportation needs to the Quad State area in accordance to the FAA regulations, state and county laws. The airport budget is just over $2 million and the airport fund is uh, self-supported and does not require uh, general fund subsidy for FY 2022. The budget increase um, this year was 41,290, which is right around 2.9%. Um, that increase is mainly due to the two and a half step uh, increase as well as the 1% COLA. Um, if you look in the, the packet uh, that we give, um, on the agenda, uh, some of our expenses um, include general operations, airfield operations, business parks, terminals, tea hangar, uh, fuel farm operations, rental properties, uh, airport rescue firefighting services, and airline services. Uh, the majority of our revenue um, on the airport comes from uh, rent for corporate um, hangars, as well as tea hangars uh, and landing fees and things like that. Um, do I have any uh, questions? Commissioners, thoughts? Good job. It was short and sweet. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right. Hearing no more questions. Thanks, Thank you very yep. much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Play Randy likes it, 100 words or less. That, boy, that was a good one. <laughs> yes, it was. I actually counted Sarah's. She had 110. Oh, oh. All right, thank you. Um, next item on the agenda, Washington County Free Library budget. Uh, please have the director or executive director of the library come in. You brought 
the big guns with you, Hal Martin and Eric. Oh. Welcome, everybody. Good morning. Um, Good morning. Good morning. Please introduce yourself and, the, and your guest in the matter, please. Yes, sir. My name is Jenny Bacus. I'm the executive director of the Washington County Free Library. With me today, I have Stephen Schutte. He's our uh, board president. Thank you for having me. Is this your first me. visit in front of us? It is my first Good. visit. The last Congratulations. Time, yeah, I, the last time um, I had just started, it was about four months uh, into my employment that COVID hit. And you brought COVID here. To yes, work. I did. <laughs> I did. I'm so sorry. Now but, we know. Uh, now we know what so this is. is my first time I'm able to get here in person. So it's nice to see everybody. You're welcome. Thank you. Well, like I said, my name is Jenny Bacus. I'm the executive director of the Washington County Free Library. I appreciate the time you're taking to learn about uh, what your library means to the community. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna ask whoever's doing the slides, you can just go ahead and press through the entire timeline. There we go, okay, just for the sake of time. So this is a timeline of what our 2020 and our early 2021 has looked like. In early 2020, we started monitoring the COVID-19 situation just like everybody else in the world. And on March 13th, we made a decision based on discussions with the state and other library leadership to close our library to the public on March 13th. Immediately after that closure, we were all still working and we began working on a reopening plan framework that was actually used as the model for other libraries in the state of Maryland. We began doing our curbside pickup in all of our locations on June 1st. And throughout June, it was a very, very popular service. And we actually have not stopped doing that program since June. It's still a very popular program. In July, we continued our regular summer reading program through uh, virtual formats and story times and everything, which I'll talk a little bit more about later. In August, our patrons began, we began preparing for our patrons to return. And in September, our library branches did reopen. We worked really closely with the Washington County Health Department and the Maryland Department of Health to make sure we were all on track and opening in a safe way. Um, in October and November, it was all very popular. Uh, people were really excited to be back. But unfortunately, due to some increased numbers of, com of community spread and under the recommendation of our local health department, we returned just to curbside pickup only. December and January, we worked hard to continue the curbside pickup, our phone reference. And actually, as of last month, February 16th, we were, go ahead, we were cleared to go ahead and reopen. And we were actually the first library in the state of Maryland to reopen this calendar year, which is something we're very proud of. So, thank you. Um, and you can see a few staff members here. I always like to tell stories with pictures. So you can see a few staff members here doing what they do best, assisting the community even in times of hardship. So you can see some of our STEM kits that we were doing and our staff picking out books for them. So customers are placing holds by visiting the online catalog or calling the branch library. Then they schedule an appointment to pick up those materials at their preferred locations. In June 2020 alone, our Fletcher Blanche Library downtown had over 1,200 curbside pickups at, their, at that location. Customers are able to speak with library staff at all branches about their research needs, homework help, tech assistance, information about local services, and more. And in fact, we had a demand for curbside printing services, so customers that needed to print out homework for school, research resumes, could actually come up to our doors, print things out for free, and we can hand it to them through uh, safe methods. And as you can see in this picture here, this is just one of the many days of curbside pickup. You can see it's multiple items, generally in most orders. Um, thank you. So over 700, oh, I'm sorry, the Bookmobile typically visits senior care and retirement communities, daycares and Head Start programs and other stops throughout the county on a regular basis. In 2020, Bookmobile staff identified customers that could not access curbside pickup services and made deliveries directly to people's homes. Over 735 community members registered for library cards during the building closures. 
WCPS students continue using their rail cards to check out materials using curbside pickup and access e-library materials and databases. And community members were excited to learn that branch library Wi-Fi connections were available outside of most of the buildings. Our Fletcher Library staff worked with Antietam Cable to create a hotspot in the parking lot for families and individuals to use completely for free. Virtual programs played a major role in how we communicated with our patrons this year. We moved our interactive story times online, provided free concert performances, writing workshops, and more. The Maryland State Library presented their operating budget summary to the General Assembly recently. This included information about e-library materials like e-books, e-audiobooks, digital magazines, and more. The total number of digital materials owned by Maryland libraries, and just to clarify, the way that digital materials work in the state of Maryland is we all purchase those materials together and it's open for the entire state. So the total number of materials owned by the libraries together increased by over 1 million items in fiscal 20 to 3.6 million items. The number of digital materials accessed at Maryland libraries also grew in fiscal 20 to 17.6 million items. In Washington County, we have a service called Hoopla. That service increased in usage by 50% in FY19 to 20. And in FY21 so far, we've seen an average increase of 52%. Use of BrainFuse, which is an online resource for students that is free tutoring um, and it's live for them, it increased by 632.5% from fiscal 19 to 20 and 74.5% this fiscal year. New patron sign-on to Libby by Overdrive, which is another 24-7 e-library service, increased by 267% in March of 2020. That positive trend has continued with new sign-ons increasing by 135% overall from fiscal year 20 to 21 so far. Through strategic partnerships with our other community stakeholders, your library continues to support Washington County through rapid changes with local with the goal of shared access. This year, we worked closely with the Health Department of Washington County as we created our phased reopening plan. We worked with the Discovery Station, the Hub at USMH, the Judy Center of Washington County to offer weekly story times on social media. And our Young Adult Department downtown worked closely with partners at the Hospice of Washington County for a grief group, grief group that meets regularly. This summer, they developed a grief walk with signs that travel throughout the county to guide walks with information to provide healthy grieving practices during such a difficult time. So your library by the numbers. Right now, we're sitting at around 79,816 active borrowers, which is about 53% of county res residents are registered library users. We're looking at around 744,432 borrowed items. 200, or 228,415 program attendees and 366 questions answered every day at your libraries for a total of 133,688 questions. That's a lot of questions. That's, that's, that's a, a lot of questions. That's a a year year I, I, need, I need to see And that's year round, that's every yeah. day. Yes, yeah. that is. And I guess today we'll add more to that too. Absolutely. Right. That's something we love. It's something we love. So I like to provide, um, I like to provide you an analysis of a, a return on investment. So you can see here we're using a retail value calculator to estimate the value of services offered by the library. And you can see that the community benefits are right around $24 million. And that's interlibrary loans, materials, database searches, study room usage that we provide for free to a lot of users. Return on investment, so every dollar spent on library services by Washington County, the community receives approximately $4.84 worth of services. So looking ahead, our usage was up prior to the shutdown. Um, for example, at downtown teen programs, during eight months before we, we were open to the public was up 120% from, from the first eight months of the previous year. Our children's program system-wide are up about 150% from the previous year. And our Hancock Library, which is our newest facility, 
the gate count of customers entering the building was 94% higher than the previous year, which is something we're very proud of. We also have to consider the impact of recent state bills on the library budget, especially the recent passing of a bill for libraries statewide to make children's cards fine free as of this month. We continue to look forward to a tradition of modern, beautiful spaces in this community. And we are also looking forward to bringing back in-person programs, meeting room rentals, public trainings, and, and beyond as soon as it's safe to do so. So in fiscal year 22, we are asking for $3,323,510. And this, is, this increase is comprised of a 2% cost of living increase for staff and to support a one-time IT infrastructure upgrade. I didn't go into it too much into this uh, program, but the library does provide a lot of IT support to both the county and the city of Hagerstown. Thank you so much. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions. I'll just say two quick ones. More yes, curiosity. Sir. Sure. Uh, Brain Fuse, uh, that's a tutoring service? Yes, sir. So if I was a student and one tutored in geometry, could I come online and, and, and what would the average fee for that be? It's totally free for the customer. It's a program that we have through our Western Maryland Regional Library. And uh, yeah, that's exactly what you would do is you'd sign up and you'd have a live teacher, a certified uh, teacher working with you through your, your program and your projects. It's a good service. I, I didn't and know it's that. an amazing yeah. service and we get a lot of fantastic feedback on it. And, and it was something we worked with the schools. When shutdown happened, we were, constantly talking to them to, to link us together, and that program's actually listed on their website as a resource. No, I, I, that's good, thank you. Yeah, absolutely, thank you. Commissioners, any other thoughts? That makes 337 <laughs> questions. No. <laughs> See, I was listening. That's pretty good, that's pretty good, thank you. Um, hearing none, um, we thank you. Any other? <coughs> hearing none, thank you very thank much you for very your much presentation. Thank you very much for your time. We appreciate you. what you do. Thank you very much for your support. Thank you all thank very you. much. Thank you very thank much. much. Thank, you. Um, thank you. Um, seeing that concludes our agenda <coughs> items, I would entertain a motion to go into closed session. Motion to go in closed. Second. I have a first and second. Thank you. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Thank you all very much. Off the